Now on to our final speaker, who is another hero of Gloucester's archaeology, the, the excellent and outstanding Carolyn Hayway. Um, Carolyn um, sent me a copy of her her background, and it, it is glorious. Carolyn was head of Gloucester City Excavation Unit from 1973 to 81, archaeological advisor to the Diocesan Advisory Committee until, to, until, to, until 2007, uh, archaeological consultant to Gloucester Cathedral for 25 years, and the list goes on. And she's still today director with her husband, Richard Bryant, of Past Historic, which designs and produces archaeological books and journals. Uh, today, Carolyn is going to speak about um, Gloucester Abbey, the Romanesque elements, and she's going to be um, basically speaking about elements from her recent book, which is really excellent. So now I will hand over to Carolyn. Thank you very much. I commence from dirt archaeology to buildings archaeology. After 30 years as cathedral archaeologist, I came to appreciate just how remarkable is the survival of the Norman Abbey of St. Peter. There have been many reconstructions and architectural theories from professors Christopher Wilson and Malcolm Selby, among many others. However, by 2001, there existed a cartographical survey as well as various photogrammetric surveys, which could be used to create accurate plans and elevations of the Norman remains. Richard Bryant and I were able to do this and in the process to re-examine the many theories, some are conflicting about the Romanesque or Norman church. We consulted many people, too many to acknowledge here, and the project turned into a book available from Oxbow Books, where they are now half price at £11.50. <laughs> we have not ventured into the 14th century or described in detail the extraordinary process that changed the Romanesque building into a Gothic one. If you visit the cathedral, you can see the south transept visitor point has a dramatic video of this transformation. The alterations of the 14th century are, are a study in themselves though they do have their own problems, which I shall mention later. The Cathedral Church at Gloucester, formerly St Peter's Abbey, had its origins as an Anglo-Saxon minster founded in 679. The position of the original minster is unknown. Sorry, Amy. Um, and uh, Mike Hare's preferred location is under the present cloister outside the Roman wall, which itself raises questions which can't be dealt with here. The abbey was refurbished in 1058, but probably on the same site. After the Norman conquest, Abbot Serlo, appointed in 1072, rebuilt the abbey in 1089 following a fire. It was dedicated in 1100. It's worth emphasising that there's no documentary evidence for the Norman building phases and very little for anything later, so the building itself is primary evidence. What remains of Serlo's original abbey is shown in this 1890 drawing by the first cathedral architect, F.S. Waller. The ambulatories and nave and the turrets of the transepts are all still complete. Some views emphasize the Norman nature of the building. By the time of the dedication ceremony in 1100, it is assumed that the east end transepts and enough of the nave to provide support were finished. The building thus far was executed in a very simple style. This is an important marker for Serlo's work. Serlo died in 1104, but work continued into the 12th century. The original design of the crypt was much more slender and less chunky, to use a technical term, than this. It also had a groin vault, that is without ribs. But as the upper stories were being constructed, subsidence began and major reinforcing was necessary in the form of additional ribs and arches and thicker encasing piers. At this stage, some chevron ornament was incorporated 
subsidence and movement were to be major problems in the next few centuries. The Eastern arm of the new church had the same plan on three levels, crypt, ground and tribune. It was constructed with fine ashlar work. It had some idiosyncrasies, which we know from no other building of this period. For instance, wedge springers. This curious way of building an arch may have been done by masons unfamiliar with Norman building methods. The very simple original appearance is still apparent at the east end. There is no chevron ornament, indeed hardly any ornament at all. The north transept chapel is still much as it was when Serlo finished it, but the transepts themselves were transformed in the 14th century using applied mouldings disguising the Norman fabric. The vault was replaced and large windows inserted. Our daughter Gemma is working on a 3D reconstruction of the Norman Presbytery. This is completely unfinished because it doesn't have the outer walls, but even so it makes clear the horizontality of the general effect, the sheer chunkiness of it. The most dramatic 14th century transformation was here in the presbytery where the walls and roof were raised, the massive piers cut back, mouldings applied and the extraordinary great east window inserted. It's an amazing example of engineering skill. During the 14th century transformation, the two central piers, presbytery and tribune level, were removed. 19th century excavations at the installation of the Riados, as well as the recent survey, showed that the design of the four was unusual. They were very slightly ovoid. In most Romanesque churches, the piers were all the same size. And on the curve of the apse, the arches got tighter because they had to be closer together. But at Gloucester, at ground as well as tribune level, the eastern four piers are slightly elongated so that the arch spaces can all be the same size. Gloucester, unlike other Norman abbeys adapted in the Gothic period, retained its choir galleries. These, even with the later strengthening ribs, look much as when completed in the late 11th century. The eastern bays of the gallery, as I have said, were replaced in the 14th century by the great east window with the ingenious cantilevered whispering gallery, the entrance is shown by the arrow. This takes one round the window to the other side. As the Norman superstructure was dismantled in the 14th century, various bits of it were reused for instance, a Norman capital has another capital used as a base. In addition, there is a shaft on the inward facing apse cord pier in situ. This is particularly important as an indication for a stone vault. There are also very many reused bits on the outside the Masons must have used most of the dismantled parts of the Norman building. For instance, there are double roll mouldings reused in this 14th century buttress. Norman shafts used in the 14th century windows. And this huge capital, nearly a metre wide, now rebuilt into the outside of the presbytery clear story, may have supported the main rib of the vault. An important survival is the short length of Norman arcaded direction on the north exterior of the presbytery. You can also see the base of one of the corner turrets on the tower. The remains of two more can be seen in the nave roof space. High level windows can only be accommodated at this level if the stone vault was a groin vault, and even then they would be quite small. We have taken Malcolm Thirlby's view that there was in fact a barrel vault like those which existed at Tewkesbury and Pershaw in the West Country group of churches of similar date. If Malcolm is right, 
the church would have had no clear story windows at all in the presbytery, except in the apse at the east end, and it would have been very dark. There was, however, a clear story passage, which could have been to gain access to the windows in the apse but it might have had an additional function. It could have had inward facing openings, as Malcolm Thurby suggests. Arrows show similar inward facing openings at Pershaw. At Gloucester, there are columns of the right size reused in the Tribune Gallery. At Gloucester, it is clear that there was also an arcading on the transepts. If the transepts were also barrel vaulted, then there were no clear story windows there either. Tewkesbury was founded by Robert Fitzhaman in or after 1087. It was being built apparently at the same time as Gloucester, and it is identical in many respects. It had arcading on the outside of the nave and transept with barrel vaults in both locations. It also retains its Norman tower, which has not survived at Gloucester, except for the base of the turrets. The Gloucester tower turrets were, were an unusual feature. They don't occur at Tewkesbury, and we don't know of surviving Norman examples in Great Britain. The transepts were originally identical in their eastern, ex in eastern internal elevations. As we have said, they were transformed in the 14th century with applied mouldings and large windows. However, the south transept suffered far more from the structural problems, which I mentioned earlier. The south transept chapel was decorated in the late 19th century by Thomas Gambia Parry. The decoration, though a splendid medieval evocation, obscures the structural history. The buttress, which now crosses the entrance, was a 13th or 14th century attempt to redress the leaning out of the tower. The present entrance shafts and capitals look Norman, but are fake. The original 11th century chapel was a mirror image of that on the north. The severe structural problems in the south transept may have begun almost as soon as it was built. Incidentally, we are particularly grateful to John Rhodes for his interpretation of this point. Not only did the tower move southward, the southeast turret of the transept moved also, and it's, it's still out of vertical today, occasioning the reinforcement of the two southern internal openings. At the same time, the south wall of the transept the south wall of the south transept must have been rebuilt in the mid 12th century with much chevron, explaining the contrast to the severity of the rest of Serlo's east end. We assume this, but we don't know because the whole thing was rebuilt again for the third time in the 14th century. The wall face of the south transept was taken down and set back by a meter reusing most of the stone, including the 12th century chevron. A large window was inserted. <clears throat> the original wall, passage, uh, wall passages were an important element. Access was up spiral stairs in the corner turrets to Tribune Gallery, and then to clear story level. With the 14th century thinning of the south wall, the entrance to the original passage was um, and are visible from outside. The clear story passages now open into nothing. The entrances have been converted into windows. There should have been similar passages in the north transept, but there the arrangement is different. This is the termination of the passage on the right. The vault can be seen to be sloping down, Confusingly, the blocking of the opening slopes up. <laughs> the entrance at the northwest corner is lower by about three meters, as you can see in the drawing on the left. And we've no idea why this should be. The nave 
built after about 1100 survives almost in its entirety. The nave is dominated by giant order columns, which was also the case at Tewkesbury and Pershaw. Tewkesbury once had a Norman barrel, barrel vault, but at Gloucester there are clear story windows, so the must here had been a groin vault, like the one surviving in the North Isle. The triforium level still survives with pairs of double openings. There is no continuous wall passage at this level. Instead, the openings are accessed, accessed from the roof space above the aisles. The original Serlo severity was by this time abandoned and there is increasing use of chevron and other carving so that by the time the builders reached the West End, there was a particularly elegant display. The South Isle was also subject to movement. It was rebuilt in 1318 with large windows ornamented with ball flower and external buttresses. The internal Romanesque responses were retained, though they are still leaning outward. The West End is the only uncertainty in our plan. It was rebuilt in the 15th century. It may have been unstable for many years. One of the towers fell in 1164. Until recently, it was claimed that the Norman West End terminated further west. Then during Project Pilgrim, the Western Wall was located during excavations by border archeology. span as we have heard. This was initially thought to be the foundation of the 15th century West End, but it's overridden by the foundation of the 15th century buttresses and the red sandy mortar of the outer facing is identic uh, identical to early 12th century mortar used at St Oswald's Gloucester. Also the block coursings are similar in size to the lower Norman part of the walls of the South Isle. It is interesting that Serlo's build in the eastern arm was a fine ashlar, as we have seen, but by the time the nave walls were built, the masons were using slightly smaller and less well-dressed blocks, which were probably rendered and painted to look like ashlar. The west end is the only part of the plan where we had to guess. We've reconstructed a west end based on Tewkesbury which had a deeply recessed Western entrance. Also at Tewkesbury, the plans included Western towers. Although they were never built, the stubs of the walls are visible in the roof spaces at Tewkesbury, and we've assumed that they were in fact built at Gloucester and that the Norman church originally had twin Western towers. The Norman claustral buildings survive in part, but only some had been surveyed with the same accuracy. The abbot's lodging, now church house, started life as a three-storey early 12th century tower block to which was added in the 13th century an open loggia with rooms above. The gable has been rebuilt using chevron. This reuse must also be 13th century. Some parts of the windows might be in situ. Church house may actually be a remarkable Norman survival. It needs a very thorough investigation for which we did not have the resources. <clears throat> the other claustral buildings have mostly been rebuilt subsequently, including the famous cloister. The 11th to early 12th century parlor where the monks could talk to visitors has survived as well as the Eastern passageway which is now the treasury. The chapter house burnt down in 1102, but shows at the West End the fire reddened remains of the original three arched entrance. St. John Hope excavated the freighter in the late 19th century and described a Norman under undercroft. Also, he seems to have left, uh, alas, he seems to have left no records. But the fact that the freighter is based on a Norman building means that the Norman cloister was on the same plan as the present one. 
This arch, shown in the drawing by Richard Bryant, reminds us of the sculpture we have lost. It is reused in the basement of the Ab Abbot's lodging in Church House, but it may originally have been part of the cloister or even a screen in the Abbey Church. Today, the appearance of the cathedral church is Gothic, yet as we have seen, there is still plenty left of the Norman church. As we mentioned, we've not ex examined the process of the Gothic, Gothic transformation. One problem represents a fundamental disagreement between the archeological and the art historical evidence. The ball flower windows of the South Isle have the unusual attribute attribute of a date, 1318, when work began on the South Isle, which was rebuilt with great expenditure. Other ball flower ornament at Gloucester is dated by Richard Morris, um, that's Mouldings Morris, <laughs> we, as we call him, to distinguish him from the various other Morrises, uh, is dated by Richard Morris to the 1320s. However, the transformation of the presbytery is supposed to post-date the burial of Edward II in 1327 and to belong to the 1330s. The works included the raising of the ambulatory walls to enable the building of much larger clear story windows. Yet in this drawing by Steve Beg Bagshaw, it is obvious that one or other of these must be wrong the 1320s ball flower occurs in the gallery windows, uh, both in the northeast chapel and as here above the eastern transept chapel, and they clearly intrude in what, into what is supposed to be new fabric created after 1330. So there may be another story here that the raising of the wall was done in the late 13th century, which implies that there's a whole set of undocumented activities. There is curiously little 13th century work at Gloucester, except for the nave vault and the enigmatic structure called the reliquary, now in the north transept. Yet the church was then extremely dark and we wonder how they tolerated it for so long. There may have been a late 13th century enlargement of the presbytery and its windows, which in its turn is now overlaid by the later 14th century work. It just goes to show that interpretation is never complete. Also that archeologists and art historians can disagree. The Abbey had a distinguished art architectural history after the 14th century works with the magnificent cloister and the Lady Chapel as highlights. The Lady Chapel finished only a generation before the dissolution which occurred at Gloucester in 1540. At that point, the Abbey Church and buildings might have been pulled down, but rescued after being create, created a cathedral by Henry VIII. In the ensuing years, the, big, the buildings became very dilapidated. They were saved by 19th century energy and by the first cathedral architect, F.S. Waller, who died in 1905, he should take much of the credit for our understanding, as well as the good condition of the building. Equal credit, however, is due to recent architects and in particular to the Masons. Gloucester is fortunate in having a team of skilled craftsmen led by Master Mason Pascal Michalisan. It is also a renowned training center for stone masons. They spend their lives replacing, replicating, and sometimes augmenting the work of their predecessors. Our book is dedicated to them. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank, thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much, Carolyn. That was brilliant. I, I do recommend Carolyn Richard's book. Um, the Cathedral is like an extraordinary three-dimensional puzzle. and. Um, you will look at it with different eyes when you start to see the extraordinary complexity of what's going on there. The walls that have clearly been taken down, the entrances blocked up, new entrances opened. It's remarkable and um, quite, 
Mm -hmm. Be prepared to lose an afternoon walking around there, though. 